I can remember one night we knew we were hitting a uh, foreign fighter safe house. 10 dudes were in there, right? We, we know we got 10 cats in there. Does it make sense to launch the dog in there knowing we got 10 guys in there? Nope. Now you got the jock going, send the dog. No, we're not sending the dog, right? And, and the boys are in agreement. We're not rolling in there either. We know there's 10 dudes in there. What are we going to do to solicit something to, you know, change the outcome? Well, we ended up dropping 500 pounders danger clothes anyway. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I served war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we hear the combat story of 29-year Army Special Operations veteran Rick Hogg, who spent time with the 82nd, 7th Special Forces Group, and U.S. Army Special Operations Command, or USASOC. His time ranged from Desert Storm deep into the post-9-11 era. Rick spent years as a K-9 handler in the special ops community, forging a very strong bond with his dog Duco in particular. Rick managed through years of deployments and overcame the effects of traumatic brain injury, the very concerted focus on his own health, and transition from the military that many can learn from. After leaving the service, Rick now owns Warhog Tactical, which offers mobile firearms, tactical, and canine training to civilians, military, and law enforcement agencies that was born out of his experience training in Special Forces. He's written the book, The Firearms Training Notebook, 1% Better Every Day. He co-hosts the On the Range podcast and founded the In Honor of Duco charity. I hope you enjoy this wide-ranging and emotional discussion with the use of sock operator as much as I did. Rick, thanks for taking the time to share your story with us. Thanks Ryan, for having me on. Appreciate it, bud. So I wanted to start out with, uh, with the name, actually. I've not met somebody with the H-O-G-G hog last name. I will say it lends itself incredibly well, in my opinion, to the career that you've had with the different units and what you're doing uh, post-service. But I just thought taking us back maybe to your family background, like where does that name come from? Uh, so actually the hog name comes uh, from the Scottish side, 1814, if I recollect, just south of uh, Edinburgh. Uh, that's where the hog clan was started at. Um, what I haven't figured out is exactly when the hogs migrated over here to the U.S. Because here's the thing. We've basically got two sets of hogs in the U.S. You've got your Texas hogs. So if you're from Texas, people know hog, right? So there was a governor hog down there, um, I believe in the early 1900s, if my memory serves me right. Again, I'm not a Texan, so I don't have that history. Uh, had a couple daughters, Amayura, uh, you know, yeah, you laugh about it, but that's what they were, that, that was their names, man. Yeah. Uh, but we are the New England hogs, so separate clan. Um, so not quite sure where the hog clan split on its journeys over here to the U.S. Yeah, but we are Scottish-based uh, two G's. And here's the thing. People are afraid to say it. It's hog. Don't I've had everyone try do to they try to church it up. What do they do? Yeah. They, they try to, uh, is it hog? No, it's hog. It's got two G's, right? Don't be afraid, but it's just, and that was even, you know, not so much when I was growing up. Right. So growing up as a kid with the last name of hog, you become tough because, uh, you know, they want to get on your name. It's like, dude, them are fight more, right? So a couple scraps over the name, but it's all good. Um, but, but yeah, you got people. And even when I was in the military, it's like, it's hog, you know, um, funny story because when I was in seventh group, we had, um, um, our group Sergeant major was Sergeant major roach. And it was funny. I was chatting with him one day about last names and he's like, yeah, you know, people try to call it Roche and I, God only knows what they try to call hog. You know, it's like, you know, it's like, I got a Sergeant major, just call it what it is, you know? It's That's roach, right. it's hog, it's like, go with it. But no, that people don't want to. But there like has it. been some people, I will say this, um, there has been some people I've heard that have used the hog, uh, but then there's also some that have an E on the end, not quite sure where that came in uh, history-wise, but that doesn't quite roll in the family tree. So, okay. yeah. Love it. So did most people, if they knew you when you were serving, was it they knew you by hog or Rick oh, yeah. or some other call sign? No, it was, I mean, so obviously when you first, obviously when you first start off as hog, right. Once you kind of transition over to special operations, then it becomes Rick. And then you don't really know what people, you know, you don't know people's last names. It's just, everything's a first name basis. Um, so yeah, people go, Hey, you know, so-and-so. And I'm like, mm, if I saw a picture, I probably would, but yeah. you know, giving me a last name doesn't help. No, it doesn't so. help. 
Yeah. Um, I will say I, I interviewed um, Scott Mann recently, who, who was a seventh group guy as well. And he was mentioning one of his first deployments in uh, pre 9-11 in South America and meeting mm-hmm. up with his NCO, who was Dick Large, which <laughs> was just a great name. It's, yep. So it was only only uphill from there. All right. Yeah. So you're New Englanders. So you're Northeast, not not the Texan yep. side of the clan. Nope. Um, growing up, if we kind of look back at uh, at Rick as a younger guy, would we see somebody who has a, a million things going on, um, hands in different pots, running different uh, businesses like you are today? No, you wouldn't. You'd see a kid that's pretty much out um, leaving the house at, hey, when the sun comes up and coming back, you know, right before the sun comes down, because that's kind of what we did as kids back then. Uh, what I was all into, mm, you know, I won't say it was all nefarious, you know, but hey, kids are being kids, you know, but it was one of those, that was a different time. It was a great time to grow up. We didn't have technology, right? So time and place was critical. Yeah, Time was, time was a huge part. So, hey man, if we're going to meet 730 down at the pond to go fishing or to go shoot frogs or whatever it is that we're doing, that's, that's what we did. Right. And I mean, them little bastards make some noise. So you want to sit there and go, Hey, we got to help out the frog population work on your marksmanship, you know? Um, but it was all time and place and it was just, it, it was a simpler time. Um, you weren't worried about rolling out the door and, you know, something happening to you being scooped up, you know, um, uh, this day and age, I mean, crime's out of control. People concerned about their safety. I mean, I'm a concealed carry holder. I carry a gun all the time. You know, it's just, did we have guns back then? Yep, we did. Um, did guns go to school? Guns did in the back of pickup trucks, right? Because you're going to sit there and go do some hunting in the morning. Hey, I'm rolling into school. There's nothing to roll in the school parking lot. And I mean, you got pickup trucks with, whether it's rifles, shotguns, and primarily, you know, shotguns because Southern New Hampshire was shotgun only. So it was either that or bow when it came to hunting. Um, so there wasn't a lot of rifles out there. But did anyone get shot? Nope. Because if we had issues or dramas, hey, man, for us, it was Smoker's Corner, right? I was talking to another guy. They had their place, you know, whatever street. But uh, where I grew up, it was Smoker's Corner. Meet you at Smoker's Corner at 3 o'clock. And we're going to settle whatever problem we got, right? You're going to duke it out. There were no knives pulled, no guns, no clubs. You duke it out, and at the end of the day, that's how you settled things as men. Uh, unfortunately, this day and age, you know, you got a bunch of Sallies out there that are doing stupid stuff. So, uh, I mean, it, that's what it early is. were you at Smoker's Corner? Like, at what age would you have found yourself in that type of situation? Um, and why? To settle some dispute with somebody, right? So that was mainly. So, for me, the high school and 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 um junior high were kind of they were together or they were they were geographically close but like smoker's corner or this little section divided the two for lack of better terms there wasn't a whole bunch of scrapping going on in junior high right uh it was mainly in high school and it was that was the thing you knew because there was no social it was just the gossip mill flu hey man so-and-so's meeting so-and-so down at smoker's corner roger that and you got everyone out there and they just dealt their business yeah. You know, um, I don't remember the man. Now you got me trying to blow the dust off. I don't remember what time, what year. I don't even remember what we were scrapping over something stupid, you know, but yeah, you go settle it up and, and that's it. But it, uh, once it, once it was dealt with, it was done, right? There was no repercussions. There was no looking over your shoulder, thinking someone's going to shoot you, stab you. You know, it's like, well, you got your licks. There you go, buddy. End of story. And I guess you're not going to talk any smack anymore. So yeah. I think it's a common denominator of the hundred folks we've had the chance to interview. So many have had scraps at a younger mm-hmm. age where it just doesn't happen anymore. Um, the, well, the ladies, the ladies would scrap too, and their scraps were worse. Oh, these, them, oh, they were like violent savages ripping hair out. You know, you're just like, <laughs> oh, oh yeah. You know, dudes would just walk away, kind of, you know face all welted up a little bit, you know, maybe your knuckles all scuffed, depending on how many licks you had to get in. But man, them girls, they'd be pulling hair and hair would be flying out. You're just like, Ooh, that one's going to hurt. You know? Oh yeah. So it, so smoker's corner was not a, it did not care who you were. It accepted no. everybody. Yeah. I love it. Meritocracy. Yep. Um, oh, yeah. For people who are uh, listening and not watching behind you, you've got this great setup. So mm-hmm. you know, if people have a chance to, to watch on YouTube, you could see, but 
you've got American flag, kind of the, the wood American flag, but you've got a lot of canine related mm -hmm. um, stuff behind you, right? Including, I think I'm assuming that's Duco's picture, but we'll, we'll get into this. Yep. Yep. Um, you've been an operator, you've been a canine handler. Mm -hmm. As you think back on your career, do you try to associate with one or the other? No. Operator versus it, canine handler? No. It, it, okay. Here's the thing. You're you're calling me two titles. I'm not. I'm Rick Hogg, right? I was not defined by my job. And, and I think that's a key part. You know why? A lot of guys struggle when they get out because they're tied. Their identity is is that. I was a canine guy. You know, I was an assaulter. I was this. I was whatever. Dude, I'm Rick Hogg, right? I, I never let work define me as a person. Was I privileged to have those positions? Absolutely, 100%. Will not argue that point whatsoever, but it did not define who I am. Was I privileged to carry that beast in battle? Oh yeah. Was I privileged to bring him home even more, you know? Um, but no, it's, I see too many guys, whether it's military law enforcement, their identity is tied. And then now when they go to transition, they've got a terrible transition because they're tied to that. Now that you know, that rug's basically pulled out from underneath them. And that's when, in my opinion, all the problems start, you know, what am I going to do? So again, kind of this, this is a slight deep dive, right? But yes, I am Rick Hogg. I am the owner of Warhog Tactical. Yes, I am a 29 year U.S. Army Special Operations Combat Veteran. But that's, that's just kind of setting the framework, right? And I think that's what guys need to understand why do I have Warhog Tactical? Why am I in the firearm space? Why am I so passionate about it? I am because my business was actually established back in 2002. So to lay a little bit of framework, when I was working for the Special Force Advanced German Combat Committee, uh, the second group of guys to go over to Afghanistan was actually seventh group. I think at that point, it was because of our advanced German combat training. We'd actually had gotten the entire group trained. We were up doing company operations. And I think it just made sense because at that point, language didn't matter. I think when fifth group went over, they figured out, hey, well, you guys can operate at a company level if need be, right? And that that's a pretty big smackdown of power to bring to the battlefield, uh, a company worth of SF guys. Um, but those guys, when they came back, when they said, hey, man, that stuff you taught me on the range saved my life, that set the hook for Warhog Tactical. Now, it wasn't called Warhog Tactical back then, right? We had to do some rebranding and some other things, but... That's things you learn throughout the journey of being being an entrepreneur. But that set the hook. You know, so in essence, what, 15, 15 years later, a bunch of experience under the belt, we go to transition. Yeah, it was an easy deal. You know, so I I, I left. I didn't do a good job in my, my transitional process in figuring out, hey, where is my range? Where is my child hall? Where is my gym? Where is my physical therapist? Because I had all that stuff there, right? It was it was easy access. Yeah. And then you then you step out the door and you're like, ooh, where am I going to the gym at? You know, so you start realizing because everything's about time, right? Your number one most precious commodity, your time. Well, me burning 30 minutes to go to the gym, 30 minutes coming back, that's an hour of my day gone, right? Just trying to make myself, keep myself physically fit. Well, let's go ahead and get the garage gym in, right? Right downstairs. I mean, things are starting to line up where it's like, hey, man, get my workout in, boom, come back, get my work, whatever I'm doing. Um, then you got to go find a range, you know, where's that range at? Then you got to look at the civilian side, physical therapists, right? Not all physical therapists are designed the same. Hey, I need you to do this. Oh, I can't dry needle. I can't do that. Oh, if you want dry needle, that's going to cost you more money. And it's like, oh, that was for free. And I'm here I am dishing out ducats for that. And who's my new doc? And yeah. So it, it was, that was the hardest part that I did not plan um, was what kind of resources, accessories that I need to kind of maintain that same lifestyle I had when I was in. Uh, but once we kind of got all that stuff established, you know, here we have this uh, big shutdown. Oh, all the gyms are closed. Not mine. Mine's open 24 yeah. seven, you know? So, and everyone's like, oh, I need to buy stuff. I'm, I'm pretty much good to go. So yeah. So you, you had, if if that's the trouble you have in a transition, I would say compared to what you had, had mentioned earlier that a lot of guys face, which is that, mm -hmm. um, you know, really looking at themselves and tying themselves to that role. It sounds like you didn't have that. Was that 
conscientious on your part? Like you were thinking about that or you'd seen this in other people who had not successfully transitioned and just given how many people that I'm sure you work with in the veteran community today with Warhog Tactical, or mm -hmm. do you have any advice for people in how to make I, that transition better? I do. So here's where I screwed up my transition, right? So I didn't have the, uh, this great seamless transition, right? Because I didn't set my business up right because I wasn't really an entrepreneur. I was kind of dabbling. I thought I was at the 80% solution, but man, you get out and Man, I got no social presence, right? I got to figure out social. You go to SHOT Show and people are like, hey, man, can't find you on the interwebs. Oh, yeah, I got to build that under construction, telling all these lies. And now you're running back to your kids trying to get all savvy on social to get that stuff going. <laughs> but but the key part is, Ryan, here's the part to – number one, I tell every veteran I deal with, go be an entrepreneur. You work for the man for however many years, right? Unfortunately, I work for him for 29. I want to be the man. Actually, you know what? I am the man. Just don't let my wife hear that. You know, she might be, <laughs> she'll beg the She's your board but of directors or something. Yeah. Technically I'm the CEO. We dub her the CFO. Well, she is the CFO, but uh, yeah, she's definitely on the board and, Got it. you know, yes, it's, it's technically my company, but she'll probably tell you she's the owner, but here or there, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's a great relationship we have yeah. with it. But um, I would tell guys to be entrepreneurs, go work for yourself. I work harder now as an entrepreneur than I did when I was in. Now, if you're afraid of work, yeah, go work for somebody else. But if you're not afraid of work, because here's the beauty. Why am I in this space? I am in this space because this is my passion. This is what I love to do. I want to be here. I'm not here because my hand got forced. Oh, I got out at 29 years. What am I going to do? Oh, I'll go teach some guys to shoot guns. No, we established that well beforehand. This is my why, right? So now we start opening up. Um, yes, I'm doing the firearms you know, training, but then all of a sudden now we're starting to, you know, consult for different, uh, different companies. Now we're doing a product line. What do I know about products? Nothing. Figure it out. Right. Writing a book, bam, the firearms training notebook. What do I know about writing a book? Nothing. I do now, you know, um, self-published, you know, it's, so it's, it's figuring stuff out as you go. And I'm telling you, here's the other part. You, you got to, you can't talk about entrepreneurship without talking about TBI. And here's why I am learning every single day. My brain is working every single day. And again, if you look at the key things or to be successful for TBI recovery, exercise, right? <laughs> Gym's right downstairs. You know, we cranked out a, a workout as a little late behind today, you know, three o'clock my time. Um, just because we had some stuff we're trying to get settled up for shot show and got stuck unfortunately on the phone and computer but that's here nor there but still got the workout in and you get fired up right you, you're you're all motivated excited feel good endorphins going um key part to to tea by recovery exercise you know obviously uh diet and then working your brain so how do i rebuild these neural pathways that have been damaged destroyed gone man go be an entrepreneur go figure out hey man you want to write that book go write that book amazon self-published right Will I say it's easy? It's not easy because there's a lot of work, a lot of research you got to do. Now, I'm fortunate enough where I've got between uh, on the book and then uh, on the range podcast, you know, I've got a co-host, co-host, co-author, you know, my good buddy, Mark Kelly, known him since back in the 82nd. He helps me out with a lot of stuff, right? So we're, we're working together to cause, you know, to solve uh, common problems. But man, you work that brain. I'm telling you this is... Is it at 100%? No, it's not at 100%. Will it ever be at 100%? No. But it's a lot better than what it was. Yeah. I mean, I at least know where I parked the car at and don't need the key fob going, hey, press the button. Uh, maybe it's not in this park. Lot. Let me go walk over here. Or maybe I parked somewhere else. Or I don't know where it's at. Um, guys I'd known for years don't remember their names, right? So we're starting to get a little better on that. Um, but no, you've got you to gotta exercise. you got to eat right. And you've got to sit there and work the brain. So just a quick word from our sponsor, Wondery, and we'll get right back to the show. Teddy Roosevelt was renowned for his love of the outdoors, but few people know that one particularly risky excursion almost cost him his life. Against the Odds is a podcast from Wondery about the unsinkable human spirit and our ability to fight back and triumph against all odds. Each season shares thrilling true stories of survival, putting you in the shoes of the heroes 
who live to tell the tale. The newest season is titled Uncharted, Teddy Roosevelt's Amazon Expedition, and tells the tale of Teddy Roosevelt's expedition to map an unexplored river in one of the most dangerous parts of the Amazon basin. Follow Against the Odds wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. And I will tell you, as many of you have seen, hanging behind me is the Teddy Roosevelt quote, the man in the arena, because I admire him so much. I'm excited for this. And I have a feeling uh, folks who listen to Combat Story will also enjoy the exploits of none other than Teddy Roosevelt. And now back to this combat story. Just a quick question. Do you, did you yeah. have to deal with TBI? Oh, yeah. Or no? I, okay. I, I was an inpatient at the VA for six weeks. Yeah. My it, yeah. Ryan, my head was so screwed up. Um, so you want to climb a ladder, right? I couldn't climb a ladder looking up because vertigo is set in. Now everything starts getting, that's not a good place to be. Um, shooting skills dropping off. Why? Because uh, my convergence issues were going on, right? So that was part of the whole TBI. Uh, of course, you got sleep apnea, which they want to say is obstructive. Hey, morons, I'm not a sleep doc, but it's not obstructive. I'm a fit dude. Look at me. It's central, right? But nobody wants to sit there and call it central. Um, guys I'd known for years, can't remember names. I mean, just all your memory lapses. It, it was just, yeah, it, it was in a bad spot. And and literally, you're just punch drunk showing up to work, right? And you're trying to go, man, I can't engage targets as quick, or I can't process information as quick. Or maybe I'm just having a bad day or what's going on, you know? And fine, it's like, dude, you got to go get some help. And I should have got it back in 12, but I lied, right? Me and Duke end up falling out of a helicopter uh, 30 feet over Afghanistan going into a target one night. And um, yeah, I'm knocked out. The only thing I cared about was telling Doc, hey, man, I need my hand fixed because my hand wasn't working, right? Basically, we fall out, get knocked out, nods are off. I don't know how long I'm out, right? I, I would lie and say I had lost time. What's lost time? That's Rick lying, right? Rick not wanting to go, hey, my head's banged up because you're going to put me on the bench. Um, and then um, that's what that was like the – that was the one that put everything, I think, over the edge. Because if I, if I really look back, now we start – having issues and dramas and there's been all kinds of eval and the the vertigo and everything else man and you're just like good lord what's going on but you try to just you just keep going through you don't want to ask for help because you know what they're going to tell you hey dude you got to sit on the bench i don't yeah. want to sit on the bench you know so you didn't get help in 12 when, when did you end up getting that 16 <sighs> yeah just prior just prior to me getting out yeah jeez yeah. If we talked to your wife about the 12 to 16 time frame, would it have been pretty brutal on the, the home everything, front? It, everything was brutal. Yeah. Yeah. When, when the GWAT kicked off, everything was brutal. Um, you want to open up that Pandora's box? We'll, we'll open it up because I think it's important. Um, 2000, and, and you have to get my year straight, either 11 or 12. I forget. One of those two years, right? We transitioned over to Afghanistan. She's like, you don't get it. And now you got to think, I've been gone quite a bit up to said point. And she's like, you don't get it. I'm like, get what? She's like, every time the phone rings, every time I check the email, every time there's a knock on the door, she's thinking the worst. So we do a little better due diligence after that, at least, you know, for us, pretty much when we were getting done work, it's pretty much her time going to bed. Hey, let you know, done working, done at the office. And, uh, yeah, hopefully at least give her a good night's sleep. But yeah, that took a, a very long time and times where I should have gone home. Mama needed me. I got the command going, yep, you can go home. She's saying, come home. I'm saying, telling them, nope, she's good. She don't need me. We're all set. And I'm lying to both ends. Right. Why? Cause I don't want to sit on the bench and, and it stems back. I think, man, the mind. It's a powerful thing. It's powerful the fact of you don't understand what it's doing, but it has an incredible self-defense mechanism built in there. Um, when Joe Andres was killed uh, December, 20, December 24, 2005, man, 
losing Joe is something I still deal with today, right? He is my Achilles heel. Um, but it's like, it's one of those after that, you don't want to be not with the boys. Would I have made a difference that night? Nope. Do I know that? Yep. Can I say that? Yep. Does it still affect me? Yep. But it's, I don't, what if, you know, it, it, it's what, I don't like to do the what if monster, but what if this, what if that, right? So it, it, it's a powerful entity, but then in turn, what it does, it starts putting up, you know, self-defense mechanisms. So I don't want to let these guys down, right? Eat, let's say you go home. Well, what happens if I go home? What happens if something happens to somebody I know that night when I'm gone? But inadvertently, what your brain's doing, you know, you figure when we lost Joe in 05, and remind me because I'll tell you the story about Joe. Yeah. Uh, not, not what happened that night because it doesn't matter about Joe Andres, the Baghdad Christmas cake thief. But, yeah, oh, yeah, it, it's awesome. Um, but what happens is is your brain starts putting barriers for friendships. Did I know people? I did. Did I truly harness relationships after 05? Nope. Why? Because you don't want to go through that pain again, right? You, you don't, you have, I mean, you know, guys, it's not like you're, you're isolating yourself from guys, but are you truly getting to know people? Are you going to people's houses, you know, hanging out with their families and doing stuff like that? Or are you making excuses? Oh yeah, the the hamster's sick. Uh, we got to go keep an eye on it. Whatever lie you're going to tell, right? Because again, you don't want to see, you know, that night that all of a sudden the Baghdad Christmas cake thief is gone. Go through all that again. And then make things worse. How about have one of your buddy's wives tell you, make sure he comes home. You know, it's like, God bless, man. You just put that on me. Talk about a freaking burden to carry, right? Do you, do you feel like that night when you lost Joe, that that was the just one event in time that changed everything for you, or was it? Yes. Did it start yeah. before that, and that was like the the last brick well, in the wall? No, I mean th there'd been some things, you know. It, I, I think it was the relationship we had, right? Our our personal relationship. Um, I can, think can that you was explain the... Joe and the relationship you guys had, like what, what was the unit? Why was it so tight for you, Rick? Um, cause you got to think, so, um, me and Joe got together. Uh, let me think here. Uh, basically Oh four, but the beginning of Oh five, we started, um, start our rotation over to Iraq. And typically we would, we would do a three and six rotation, but, 05 was one of those. We were just, we were pretty much there the entire year. Uh, I think April and May we were off, but after that, we were pretty much there the entire time. So, I mean, you're spending with seventh group uh, with USASOC. Okay. Got it. Yep. Um, so, long story short, I mean, we'd been running hard. And I think it's, it's everything that happened, you know, to set some things in, in, in premise. I think this is kind of where, where it hit so hard was yes, me and Joe had a great relationship, right? Good buddies. I mean, I'm not going to uh, bust them for being a Browns fan or anything like that. They're still rebuilding uh, since 05, but maybe they'll make maybe one of these years. But anyway, um, I, I think that the key part where it hit so hard was when the Christmas time started coming up, you know, those little Debbie Christmas cakes, um, one of the guys would get those. And Joe, unbeknownst to me, would go and steal a pack. They used to be packaged two to a package. And I would find this little Debbie, just one, because he would eat the other one, right? And I think in his mind of, of being the jokester or wanting to clear his conscience, would hide this thing in my bed, in my boot, in my kit. I'd find these little Debbie cakes all the time. Where the hell are these things coming from? And literally, I caught the Baghdad Christmas cake thief December 24th, right before the pages went off. And we got blown out that night. I said, it's you Get looking for something to tie him up with some cuffs, some flex cuffs, some something. I said, I'm making me an apprehension. I said, I got me the Baghdad Christmas cake thief. A couple hours later, he's gone, right? So why do I talk about the Christmas cakes? Man, we can sit there and talk about what happened that night and all that other stuff, right? Are people going to remember? 
Probably not. They remember the Christmas cakes. They remember the Christmas cakes so much that when that time comes, um, I'll either get emails, texts, pictures, and guys will take either the cakes themselves, they'll take the box, they'll do something. Heck, I even got my mates from over in the UK. Granted, they sent me a picture of a fruitcake. Not the same, but it, it's the whole premise of remembering yeah. Joe, right? Um, I had another buddy of mine. He sent me box shows up in the mail. There's three Christmas cakes in there. Now, because if you go buy them today, there's six in a box. He basically took half. He kept half and sent me half. You know, so that resonates to go by telling that story. I have touched more people. I have kept Joe's memory alive. And let me tell you this. Yes, I do it for me to be selfish. But let me tell you, his family, it, that means more to them than you know. Um, I'm still in contact with one of his sisters. And I tell her all the time, right? I, I just, I'd like to just give them the updates. Hey, man. This is what's going on. Here's what we're doing. And they are so grateful that, you know, we're still keeping his memory alive. Um, you know, it's like, do I have his bracelet? I do. Do I need a bracelet to remember him? Nope. My bracelet's my bona fide item, right? Because when I see somebody else's, and again, I'm a selfish type person on this one. When I see somebody else, I'm like, who you got? Some guys, ah, you know, a buddy of mine I lost. Well, what's his name? Tell me his story, Right. Because once you get done telling your story, I'm telling my story. I mean, I remember one time in the early hurly, in the early healing process, huh, we lost Joe in 05, and here I am up at Arlington in 17, I think it was, right? Early healing. Um, I'm talking to another family up there in Section 60, right? And we're exchanging stories. They're telling me about their son. I'm telling them about Joe. You know, it, it's part of the healing process, part of keeping their memories alive. Because they say you die twice, once when you physically die, and second time when your name's said for the last time. So as long as there's lung in my air, and here's the crazy part. It's been passed on generationally. You don't think the hog kids know the whole Christmas cake deal? Yeah, because they've lived it, right? That's now in their deal. So I passed this. I passed Joe's legacy at least down to one generation, Right. Now, you don't think my kids and their kids, now they're going to pick it up. So my grandkids are going to carry the legacy on? Yeah. How many generations are we going to keep Joe's name going? I'm going to say yeah. forever. Yeah. When you mentioned that you couldn't really get close to people after that, yep. do you feel like you're still somewhere on that journey or have you solved for that? No, we solved for that. Yeah. How? Yeah. I keep my circle very tight. And if you keep a tight circle, you know, especially those that are, that are in your inner circle, you know, you, you got to kind of, there's healing that went on, right? You've got to, everyone grieves their own different ways. Um, I don't know if there's such a thing as grief amnesia, but I will tell you this. I don't, I remember when we lost Joe, I can remember the memorial service we had. What day it was, I don't know. Um, and then I remember the 27th rolling back out. And right before we rolled out, you know, call coming over the radio. Hey, this one's for Joe. Um, what happened in between? You know, I had a buddy of mine say, hey, remember the chapel service? Because, <clears throat> excuse me, we renamed the chapel um, Andres Chapel. You remember the chapel service? Nope. Nope. It, it's, a, it's a black hole. Um I remember calling my wife whenever we got phone privileges. So once the, the Andres family got notified, you know, they opened up the phones and I couldn't, I couldn't even talk to my wife. Um, She knew Joe at that time or of Joe. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I, it, it, I mean, my kids did. My kids were, were we little, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was just, Man, it was just one of those that cut deep. And then you don't you don't deal with it for so long. That's the problem. I, I didn't truly mourn for Joe. And now I'm emotional, right? Um, but let me let me say this point. I didn't I didn't mourn for Joe or really start until like 17. Um 
this is when actually when I was in the um when I was in the VA, we started picking up journaling. Um trying to get some thoughts on paper to help with that, which I think is a huge part. Wish I had done it when I was in. Uh two biggest regrets is I did not journal and I don't have a picture of me and Joe. Right? I don't have a picture of us. Why? Because you're too cool for school and can't yep. stop and take a quick happy snap, right? Uh I take pictures of with everybody now. Um I lost my train of thought where I was going. Oh, my kids, my kids knew Joe. Obviously, mama did. Um, but I forget where I was going. Well, that's TBI. Well, I did have a question as you were yeah. talking about. Yeah, basically three days in between losing him and rolling back yeah. out on an objective. You're at yeah. you suck. I know it's early in the war, but still at, at this kind of elite level. Was yeah. there any discussion of, hey, we just had this loss? How do we process this so we're not focused nope. on that when we go out on the objective? You don't. You put everything in a box, right? It, that's the thing. Oh, emotions. Remind me to get back on emotions. All that right. was the part I want to get on. Uh, no, you put everything in a box, right? So so here comes the problem. We're very resilient. The brain works incredibly well. It will put things in boxes, but the problem is the brain only has so much bandwidth. So the problem comes in. Now I'm putting Joe in a box, sticking him in the closet. Well, the problem is when the brain starts getting jacked up, you start losing bandwidth. Right. And at a certain point, this thing's just going to blow up on you. You got to give something to get something. Um, Yeah. You heard my voice and you probably saw and I got emotional. Right. Here's the thing. I don't care because it's my healing process. It's mine. So check it out. All you cool guy cats out there. Oh, look at Rick. He gets emotional. I'll crush you. I'll crush you like a bug. Right. It does nothing to affect. Uh, if you want to say my alpha, my manhood, my warrior, whatever word you want to use. Yep. Do I have some emotions? Yeah. I might even shed some tears. God forbid we start talking about Duke, which I'm sure we will. It, I don't care, right? Because it's my healing process. And that's what guys need to understand. Um, the first time the emotions came out publicly, I was shooting one of my instructional videos with uh, Paneo Productions. And the scab got flicked, right? I still had Duke at that point. So Duke was still alive at that point. But somehow thinking about Joe, talking about Joe, Man, emotions came up, and we flicked the scab. Here's the thing. We're shooting a video. We could have left it on the editing room floor. I was like, nope, leave it, because I wanted people to hear there that check it out. Just because you're emotional makes you no less of a man, an alpha, a warrior, a soldier, whatever word you want to use. I don't care, right? Heal yourself. Am I a lot better? I think so. Do I still – is there times when I can talk about it? Sure. And I don't get emotional? Yep. Is there times I do? Yeah, it does. You know, uh, it seems to be my podcast for like my Achilles heel, right? Because I typically don't want to talk about Joe. We'll talk about Duco. That's fine. I, I don't care. But that's raw. And I think people need to hear that. So uh, if you want to think that, you know, the, the old saying or the old analogy, you know, men don't cry because we all heard that when we were growing up. Biggest sack of crap going, right? Th there's a time and place for it. And uh, you got to figure out how to mourn how to mourn your dead, but then in turn, how to um, keep their memory alive. And then how do you live a life for them? Right? So if, if Joe were here today, is he going to go, Hey, slacker, what are you doing? Quit freaking moping for me and get off your butt and go to work. Right? Yeah. So we have slight, slight moments of emotions, but Hey, it's all good. All good. If, if you could have gone back to say, hey, this just happened and give yourself some advice, would you have said bottle it up so that you're focused on the mission and let it come out later? Or do you talk to yeah. other guys about this now? I kicked the can, right? I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if there's a right I, answer on this. I, no. And, and could we have done something different? Yeah. But I think everyone, I don't remember. I don't remember a whole bunch of discussion and nobody. It was almost like nobody's talking, right? And, and it's like, how do you process it? Here's the thing. If I were to go back, look at military grief counseling, um, I would say this. This And I think this is for me why the, the, the Christmas cake story is so important because it keeps his memory alive, right? What happened that night and AR in that night and shoulda, coulda, woulda, zigzag, this, that, if we had known this. It, okay, it's done. Right. Basically, God came in, took Joe, said, Hey, it's your time. Off you go. All right, cool. There's nothing we can do. But 
for those of us left, how do we, how do we deal with that? Right. Do you sit there and go, Hey man, <clears throat> excuse me, live your life in his honor. Well, what does that mean? Maybe I work harder. Maybe I stay at work 10 minutes extra, lifting more weight, shooting more, you know, round. I, I, I don't know, but I think there's better ways to deal with it than just stick it in a box, especially with all we know about TBI. You yeah. need that bandwidth because <clears throat> that brain's going to get, excuse me, that brain's going to get injured. You know, that's, that's the bottom line. Yeah. So I need as much bandwidth as I can. So why don't we figure out a healthy way to open it? Because here's the thing. Okay. So, so I'm emotional now, right? I'm emotional at the point where we're chatting about it, but you don't think if I were to sit there right now, somebody come in my house, you don't think I'm gonna say, stand by Ryan. He just voted. <laughs> Right, dude, you just voted because state of North Carolina tells me somebody comes in my house on March. I'm in fear for my life. I'm going to go ahead and do my due diligence and hey, do what I got to do, right? Because I'm scared. Um, it, it's not going to change. Take care of that business, come back, go, all right, Ryan, where are we at? Right. You know, uh, this is this is me talking. Now, <clears throat> other people will probably argue. Uh, I'm going to, I think it can be done, right? But here's the thing. It needs to be done with your mates, not with a shrink. You can have a shrink kind of there. Man, my dealings with shrinks, horrible, right? You've got some good ones out there, but you got ones that, oh, you need some pills. I don't need, I don't need no damn pills, right? When I went down to the VA, what was rule number one? No pills. I said, you can shake chicken bones. I don't care. Holistic. I'll do whatever you want. <laughs> no pills, right? What do they try to do? Pump me with pills. Pain doc. Hey, man, you need a new script for your oxy? I ain't on oxy. Beat it. You're fired. That's right. I fired I fired half my docs. Why? Because I'm in charge. It's me. Uh, my sleep doc. Oh, hey, dude, we want to give you some gabapentin and reset your brain. Well, number one, my brain's jacked up, doc, right? You're supposed to be working at a TBI clinic. Hmm, okay. Isn't, you know, gabapentin an anti-seizure medicine? Oh, by the way, you're fired. Beat it. You know? Um... One of my shrinks, because I had two, she kept going, oh, you're hypervigilant because of the war. I said, really? I said, well, if an NFL player can read the field, gets an interception, is he hypervigilant? TBI, yes, I'll give you that. His brain's jacked up. I said, is he hypervigilant? Boy, he can't answer my question. You beat it. You're fired. Now, the other one I had, she was awesome. She she was – she solved some things um, because if you want to say my – combat grief and that's the word i like to use right i don't prefer this pts because i think it's rubbish uh combat grief was the mates i never i never mourned for and the pain i caused in my family and one of my other achilles heel if you want to say was my daughter when your daughter tells you and again i think this was sub oh i'm trying to get <clears throat> have to do some higher math here yeah 16 was her that was her 18th birthday when she's telling you, hey, you've missed nine of my birthdays. Oh, so she can dagger. at least remember I've, I've missed half, right? Yeah, dagger dagger is the word. But here's the thing. Um, my, one, my one shrink, she gave me this awesome information. She's like, what do you think about having nine mini birthday parties before 18th? I said, yeah, makes sense, right? So we... We put together as best me and my wife could figure out the dates we were all gone, which is pretty much all of them, right? Um, went out and got, hey, happy fifth birthday, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth. We get all these birthday cards, right? Just do a card, put a little handwritten note, you know, to each one that was a little bit different. And boom. That's, prior that is to, a damn good idea. Yeah. That's a great one. Pri prior to, and, and here's the beauty with it, right? Prior to. We got all that stuff knocked out, had her party. She hasn't mentioned it since, right? Now, granted, she she ge geographically lives away from us. I'll even ask her, hey, babe, um, dad's got to work during your birthday. Is that all right? Eh, no problem. Hasn't been mentioned since, right? That, that piece of, if you want to say trauma, closed, done, healed, boop, we're good. She's good. I'm good. Guys, if you've got kids that tell you, um, hey, you've missed X amount of birthdays, 
granted, you don't want to wait to the last day that you're you're rolling out, but if you can fix it beforehand. And for us, those little mini birthday parties with cards and pictures and all that stuff, it sealed the deal for both of us. So yeah, that was absolutely huge. Yeah. Okay. Um, just before we leave, not not that we're going to leave, but on the topic of combat grief, um, mm-hmm. you know, we mentioned Duco picture on the mm-hmm. wall behind you. Can you talk a little bit about who Duco was, the relationship yeah. to you, why it's so yeah. important? So, Duco is, or was, however you want to look at it, um, my combat assault dog. I lost him July 5th, 2021, to osteosacoma. Why is losing that dog so, so painful? Because I'm here on this planet because of that dog, right? My buddies are here on this planet because of that dog. That's why that cuts so deep. Now, when we retired together, do you know that, hey, a dog's got, you know, a certain lifespan? Yeah, you do. But that's Duco. Duco was and is the gold standard when it comes to combat assault dogs, right? He was that good. Um, but man, when he got diagnosed with osteosacoma, you want to talk about a gut punch. That will sit there and and break you to your knees because the bond between a canine and a handler, that's a piece of my soul. Right, he is a piece of me. I am a piece of him. Um, so much to the extent, you know, every time you cut him off that lanyard, I'm like, God, please bring him back, and he did. And that beast saved us more times than you can shake a stick at. Right, absolute just phenomenon. Um, but man, when you lose him, part of your soul goes. If you've never handled one, you'll never understand it. For those other, you know, handlers out there, they know exactly what I'm talking about because we're all in the same boat. We can all say there's a piece of you missing when you lose that dog. Um, and that's how much of an impact these guys have on us. So, yeah, in turn, um, Big things happen. So how do we keep Duco's memory alive, right? I told you, Joe, we talked about that. Uh, you know, the bad deck Christmas cake thief. <laughs> Old Duco. So we have started um, the In Honor of Duco project. So we partnered with a nonprofit, uh, Scotch Wish, all volunteer 501c3. I say again, all volunteer. We get no money from this, but we have the In Honor of Duco project. Uh, our mission statement is threefold. Mission statement number one. And again, I'm selfish on some of these. Uh, It's keeping the memory of combat assault dog Duco alive, right? So kind of like we were talking about with Joe, they say you die twice physically, and then when your name's said for the last time. So we want to keep that. Here's the other key part, probably statement number two. The meat of our mission statement is to never let another SOF canine handler make a medical decision about their canine based on your finances. So when Duco gets diagnosed with osteosarcoma, yeah, it's about a thousand dollar bill just for them to sit there and go, yep, he's got cancer. And then they turn around and go, yeah, we can save his life, but that's going to cost $10,000. Right. Rear leg amputation, four rounds of chemotherapy. Of course, we're going to do it, man. But here's the thing what if you're not in the spot? You know, what if you don't have the money? So do you take the $125 option for the very beast that saved your life that I'm here on this planet? What do you go? What's it take? You know? Um, so we don't want anyone, you know, going through that again. And then, um, in support of other, um, 
canine organizations. Uh, we've vested out some officers, some canine officers with uh, ballistic vests. We've helped out um, military working dog team support association with their um, annual care package drives and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's what we're we're doing there. But we just hang hang on. I know if you got a no, question, go, go ahead. for it. Keep going up. Go. So 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 we don't stop there. Um, might as well show you. And I should have brought my my other stuff, but um, we got our in honor of Duco loop leash. So again, we had to do our remake labels to put in on Duco, but we got a, a a loop leash that was developed over in Afghanistan. Um, so that's part of our Warhog canine product line. When you say um, it was developed in Afghanistan, Rick, are yeah. you saying like something like that didn't exist the way no. that it looks today? You, you kind of based on the mission needs yeah, came we, up with this. Yeah. So, um, Hang on here. We'll have to reach on the wall as I'm knocking stuff off. So this is Duke's. So for those listening, uh, Rick's kind of on the wall behind him where he's got a lot of this gear. He's kind of just pulling him down and talking about it. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So this is, this is Duke's, this was his original leash we had overseas. Right. But here's the problem. It's just a single piece of tubular nylon. Of course, all built by ourselves. Uh, and for those of you that go sewings for sissies, you're a loser if you can't sew. How about them apples, right? All built by me. Uh, but the problem was, it's just a slick one piece. So now, because we're always wearing gloves, right? So now your gloves get wet. You're trying to hold on to this. It's slip and slide, and I don't have a good purchase point. Man, I need something else. I got to fix I gotta fix that problem. So in turn, we came up with the loop leash, which is still you know, tubular nylon. But you can see... There's loops built in. So now my hand kind of goes right in there. And then, oh, by the way, under tension, it becomes taunt. So it doesn't become a snag hazard. So it works out just fine. But now I'm not worried about, hey, let's say I'm trying to lower him and I'm using my leash and my hands are, are or my gloves are wet. Now I don't have good control of that, uh, that piece of tubular nylon. I do when I got loops in there because I got positive purchase points. Or if I need to choke up more, hey, I want to sit there and get a tighter purchase on where he's at boom i've got all that stuff worked there and then the other point is there was nothing worse than going out running and now i've got this big ball of of leash in my hand when now i can just sit there and basically take this put a carabiner around and where it has the intermediate mm. loop points and it's hard to see there yep you kind of see that yeah but now i put a carabiner in there put this thing around my waist now i've got an improvised lander in essence so now it's like, all right, buddy, I can run hand free and be good to go. So, um, yeah, it was all all kind of designed over there. So it has multitude of of functions uses. Um, but yeah, we. My biggest problem was learning to figure out the U.S. manufacturing process. Uh, of course, the shutdown didn't help things out, but I'd planned on launching it prior to losing Duke, but when we lost him. We hadn't launched it yet. And at that point I had to stop because I'm like, I am not putting this thing out without putting the in honor of Duco on the label. So that was a key, a key function. Um, so now every time that somebody buys a loop leash, you know, they get a handwritten note from me. Hey, thank you for your purchase. And thank you for helping keep Duco's memory alive. That's cool. Yeah. When you said that there are times where you might have to, um, lower Duke down, do go down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just for those who aren't canine handlers, what, what is an example of that on an op where you'd have to lower a dog down in a certain way? So let's say you've got, um, typically, you, you know, you look over at Afghanistan, Hey, you've got mud wall type compounds. All right. It might be where, Hey, I'm up there. I'm going to lower them down to somebody or somebody's going to lower them down to me. You know, so it's just passing him back and Got forth it. because, yeah, you'd, you'd like him to climb ladders, but sometimes at oh, dark 30, he can't exactly see. And <laughs> some of the ladders we had, and yeah, it was just easier. Pass him up, pass him over, pass him down. Right. Um, I wanted to try to do as much as I could independently because I didn't like to have to rely on other people. That was just me as a handler. Right. It, it, if I could be as independent, hey, man, I don't need you to go, hey, man, can you grab this? Can you do this? Can you? Nope. We try to keep everything um, where we were self-reliant, but there were just times where, hey, you needed some help was was the bottom line. 
if I can ask a mega uh, ignorant question, sure. please don't shut off the uh, the interview after I ask no, no. this, but no. was there ever an instance where you had to train jumping with a dog? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How yep. does that look? Uh, it looks like you put him in a bag right here to your front. You go out basically on a tandem type rig, you know, you throw your drogue and you guys go for <laughs> a little ride in the breeze. Yeah. Um, but here's the thing. We don't jump them a lot because the risk isn't worth, um, the juice isn't worth the squeeze, right? We've had dogs jacked up. Um, because again, all it takes is, Hey man, bad landing, something happens, boom. And now I've got this tool that other guys were relying on to save their life. Hey, he's jacked up. Right. Yeah. Um, so cool. Take him for a ride. Right. But then just go get the dummy dog and just, you know, work your proficiency with the dummy dog. Cause uh, everyone always goes, Oh man, how do they ride? They don't care. They were dad. Right. They're in a little bag. They're all sitting there all snug bug right there. <laughs> they're not working. They're being carried. They're lazy, man. They're like, we live in the dream. And that's it, man. And they get the cool breeze in their face. They go, Phew. Great, man. Here we go. Yeah. So, um, but one, one more thing I want to add, Ryan, and then yep. I'm going to hit your question. Um, so one other thing we have as far as keeping Duco's memory alive, um, we partnered with a company called Kindred Life. So we've got the war dog, two Gs, uh, in honor of Duco uh, K9 CBD. So, yeah, and it's got his picture slapped right on there. I should have brought a bottle up here, but. Cool. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we're, it, trust me, that dog. Um, and here's the thing with Duke, right? God bless people love that dog. Um, we put, we got him his own, you know, he's got his own IG page and Facebook page, right? Can you imagine a three-legged dog motivating people? He did. Well, Cause people all knew the story. People knew when he got his leg amputated. Cause I was very much letting people be aware. Cause I did a big prayer request. It's like, guys, I need your prayers, right? Duke's not doing good. Um, did I tell him everything? Nope. Um, but people were driven by him, right? I've got, um, you know, so like this hat. So that's Blackbeard's friend, Duco. Um, my buddy Rich over at Explosive Apparel Design over in the UK. I mean, he was getting ready to launch that right when Duke was being lost. He's like, hey, man, we want to call it Duco. Roger that. Cool. Um, you know, I had my buddy make the the Duco flag there. Um, Jason and Sonny up at, you know, Connecticut PD, that's, that's, they're doing there. That's um, cool. Ricky Harris, my buddy there, you know, the, the war dog Duco. And if you notice the dog has two G's playing off the hog, right. Yep. Um, has the, the, uh, two D or two G's, but yeah, you know, he did that. Um, so another buddy of mine, Aaron, and that's, um, Ellie rain's art, that picture, God bless man. When, when I got that as a gift and granted it didn't have Duco's, um patch on there but when that thing came in it, it was like looking at him man um yeah blown away so of course that's his that's his assault vest right there uh my winkler tomahawk right there so yeah we got oh that's his uh that patch right there is from um the video we shot with 511 where he actually retrieves a fully weighted carbine um yeah so yeah that's, that's uh cool. that's duke man so yeah. What was the catalyst for you deciding to do the canine route? <laughs> Ball and told that this will Against help your wishes as well. Like, I mean, I guess that's part of being voluntold, but Hey man, it'll help your, it'll help your progression. Right. So it'll slide you up into a, into a TL spot quicker. You know, you'll get promoted. Yada, yada, yada. I don't really want to do that, but Okay. You know, but I also knew in the back of my head, it's like, dude, that's more work. Right. Um, because I, I mean, I knew the dogs, I knew the value of the dogs, but man, it's a lot of work. Um, guys are sitting there on their neck or playing Xbox or whatever it is they do. You're working the dog, right? Uh, you got to work your own skills plus his skills. And, and it's almost like having that additional almost burden, right? You don't want, it's kind of like you, you don't want to let your mates down by not being fit, being a good shot, being whatever. 
well, I don't want this dog to let these guys down. At that moment of truth when we need him, he does something, right? He box, he does fails, does whatever, right? No way. So you want to make sure you've got the absolute best combat multiplier in the battlefield. That's right. I will say it. That is the biggest combat multiplier on the battlefield are those four-legged beasts by none, right? We can talk about all this technology we have, all this other stuff. They all lie to you, right? His nose doesn't lie. His nose picks up stuff. That platform up in the air that cost umpteen million dollars can't spot, you know, or you tell me, oh, you're going after two and there's three because all of a sudden he goes, poof, we got the outlaw Josie Wales over here and bam, he's on him. Thanks guys for that one. Where, where was that heads up, right? The biggest combat multiplier in the battlefield are those four-legged beasts that we bring. And yeah. Um, so yeah, it was one of those where being voluntold, best job I had by far. At you, what you point? To... At what point did you realize, like, oh man, this is actually a pretty good thing that I'm going to enjoy doing? Man, that first rotation, right? Because I'm I'm with the same guys, right? It wasn't yeah. like I got swapped over to different dudes. I'm still working with the same guys. The only difference being now I'm an independent agent, right? No one's really telling me what to do. Um, I know the playbook. I know all the guys, you know, and like <laughs> I had a buddy of mine. He would pretty much always control the call out. I, I loved him to death, man. And he'd make the call on the radio. Hey, man, where are you at? And he's doing this over the net. And I'd go right behind his ear, right behind you. And he'd go, are you ready? And I'd be like, are you ready? I, I, I know what's going on. I know how this thing plays out, right? Hey, we're sending the dog. Roger that. Put his light on, off we go, and let him do his business. Um, there's something about bringing that beast to the battlefield. And, man, when he performs, it's huge. When you sit there and go, hey, buddy, you saved our ass tonight. Thank you. Um, absolutely huge. Can you get with, – without getting into anything too sensitive, Rick, is there any shot you could give us the difference between an op – like maybe the same type of operation where you have a dog and where you don't. Like, what is that force multiplier capability that that I, kind of you I, draw I can't, back on? I really can't answer that because we pretty much always had a dog. You right? always had one. Wow. Yeah, I, that's how important these guys are. Um, granted, I didn't have one in Desert Storm, you know. <laughs> um, but no, I, I don't. I, I didn't realize of, it was that common. But for us, it was, yeah. Yeah. I, I I can't recollect an op, um, an op where we didn't have one. How about that? Yeah. The, the, the boys, trust me, the boys want that dog, right? They know the value, and and it's like every year, you know, if you could go back in the history books, and, and I wish I kept better records. How many guys are alive today, right? So we've got 24 dead dogs. That's at least 24 guys, right? At least bare bones minimum. But here's the other part. How many dogs do we have that are still alive that find that outlaw Josie Wales when you think you're only hunting two because somebody tells you it's two and now he picks up the third. And the only reason you're alive is because that dope don't have no MVGs and he's got a better spot. He's in that hidey hole spot, but he just don't know where you're at. And that dog, you see that change of behavior, bam. And he's on that dude. Yeah. How about them apples? Or you come into the room and, you know, you think it's just a big pile of crap. And next, you know, this dog's ratting through something and and he's on that dude. Right. Because that dude's he's hiding. I, I mean, it's just it's incredible to watch these dogs and what they can do. And their nose is the moneymaker. Right. Because we're operating at night. It's not like we've got doggy NBGs. It's all nose driven. They pick up that odor. And, and I'm telling you, they beat technology every single time. Um, you know, you could look at it because they were dual purpose, right? They could find explosives as well. So once you're done your assault, you're doing a uh, post-assault sweep. Hey, man, whether you find that cache or, you know, IED making material, whatever the case may be, now you're pulling even more crap off the battlefield. So it's just what they can do is absolutely amazing. Talking about the emotional side of it, 
do you remember a time, I'm sure this happened several times, but just for those who haven't handled a dog with that relationship mm-hmm. where you've had to put, you had to put Duco in harm, knowingly in harm's way to save maybe another guy on the team. And obviously he makes it through these, but mm-hmm. d- were there moments like that? And if so, how do you deal with that? Yeah. So they're kind of twofold, right? So you've got to be the dog's advocate. Um, I can remember one night we were going, um, we knew we were hitting a uh, foreign fighter safe house. 10 dudes were in there, right? We, we know we got 10 cats in there. Um, does it make sense to launch the dog in there? Knowing we got 10 guys in there. Nope. Now you got the jock going, send the dog. No, we're not sending the dog. Right. And, and the boys are in agreement, right? So it's just not Rick bucking the system going, <laughs> Nope. Figure out another way because, oh, by the way, we're not rolling in there either. We know there's 10 dudes in there. What are we going to do to solicit something to, you know, change the outcome? Well, we ended up dropping 500 pounders, dangerous clothes anyway, but here nor there. <laughs> right. But, but had I been, had I been the muck, oh yeah, send the dog, which I don't think they would have let me anyway, but cause you got the, the rear trying to control what you're doing, um, which would have had a dead dog. Right. And then what happens when you have one of those where you really need them, you know, um, you don't that here's the thing. And, and I say that because I was Duke's advocate. I launched him when it absolutely, when it makes sense. Right. I'm not holding him back because of my personal feelings. Right. I knew we weren't going to go in there. We, we got to figure out some other course of action. Right. You know, you got 10 guys bunkered up in a house. You got to do something different. But in other cases, you sit there and go, I need Duke to get out there because I need him to save the boys. If I lose him, I I don't want to lose him. But if I do and I don't lose one of my mates, then he served exactly what he was supposed to do. Right. Um, But you get savvy, man. Um, We did some things on the fly that we'd never trained or done before that you add to his survivability to give him a fighting chance said, Oh, we got to do this, do that. Hey, do this for me. Yep. 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 Boom. I mean, and the boy, they, they, this is the beauty. Nobody wants to see your dog get killed, right? He's, he's one of your teammates. If there's something they can do to assist, to add to his survivability. Yeah. They're, they're all spot on. Um, you know, kind of the, the, the rule was if he was on a bite and there had to be a shot taken, I would take the shot stipulation being, Hey, if I wasn't there, because again, we could be geographically separated because he's not always with me all the time, you know? Yeah. Another dude could take the shot. We had one night where he was on and what, what do you mean on a bite? Like he, he physically has, he's biting, he's biting an individual. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, because the, the thing is where I know his movements, right? He's got a certain pattern what he's going to do on that bite. So it's easier for me to take the shot anticipating what he's going to do his movement wise versus somebody else who might not. And then potentially, Hey, he zigs when I think he's going to zag or, or whatever the case may be. Um, and yeah, when there's, you know, one night where old boy kind of beat me to it, just the way things were geographically separated. And he's like, dude, the shot was clean. Dude, I'm not worried about it. Right. I, I got the utmost faith in your ability. Right. <laughs> He's worried you're going to be like, hey, this is mine. You yeah, know, don't mess with it, the dog. Yeah, no, it, it's, no that sense it's like, of... no, it, it, yeah. But, I mean, that's how much it's, it's, he is that much part of the team, right? If he was wounded on the battlefield, we're calling a medevac in for him just like anybody else. And he's not going to some jack neck vet either. No, he's going to the cash. He's going to have U.S. surgeons, you know, that works on humans, treat him just like a U.S. service member and take care of him. Granted, he's a little furrier, but. AMP is AMP, right? For the most part, we needed a, a couple of things like the the ET tubes and stuff like that had to be a little bit longer just because of their longer esophagus. But dude, we had that we had that stuff prepo there, it, yeah. But it, it's not, dude. Just fix my dog, right? It's not rocket science. Quit the quit the red stuff coming out. Patch them up, and yeah, let's go. So when you you had alluded earlier to uh, working with some of your mates from the other side of the pond with the Brits. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you worked with the Aussies. I don't know oh, yeah. if they, if you'd work like cross dog training with them mm-hmm. for lessons learned, but oh, just yeah. curious if you did, is it pretty similar TTPs that you would use or are you kind of learning from each other based on, I, I don't know, historically how they've employed dogs? 
Um, it's pretty much all the same. We're you tweak TTPs when it makes sense, right? And it, and that's usually typically um objective to objective type things, right? Where something pops up you're not anticipating. Um, you know, going back to that that one foreign fighter safe house I was talking about. Yes, Duke had been around um you know, especially rotor wing fire and stuff like that, right? You want to get him acclimated to that. So he's, you know, no dramas there. Uh, he wasn't super keen when they'd uh, test shoot the miniguns and the door gunners wouldn't give me a heads up, get a little pissed off on that. But, you know, the regular birds flying, shooting rockets, all that. He was he was good with all that. Nowhere have we ever trained or talked about, hey, man, uh, if you're going to drop bombs danger close, you might want to muzzle your dog. But something just said... Let me just stick his muzzle on, right? And thank God I did because he came freaking unglued, right? So, oh, yeah. Oh, think about it. He's eating all that overpressure yeah. just like us. And he just, yeah, never been exposed to it. First time, like, what in the world's going on? He just, yeah, went uh, <laughs> that crazy. So it's just, hey, uh, word of advice, guys. If you're going to have stuff come in danger close, you might want to muzzle him up. Just, you know, uh, just a slight preventative so no issues, dramas happen. But, yeah, yeah, that was kind of that was kind of the thing's. Um, pretty much all that, all the same TTPs are pretty much the same. You just kind of cross pollinate on some different, you know, different things, maybe different applications on some certain things. Um, but yeah, super, super dudes on both sides, man. Great guys. P pivoting slightly. Th this is a question mm -hmm. I wanted to ask as I was just looking up your background, Rick. So you did time with the 82nd and then obviously a lot of time in the special ops community, special mm -hmm. forces, special ops. Yep. For people who aren't familiar, a lot of people who listen to the show are not veterans, right? But they just mm -hmm. appreciate the military background. They they hear a lot from special operators because I think it just people have, have not seen much of them. Mm -hmm. But they don't understand as much about the conventional side. Having done both, how would you describe the difference between those two roles? How did you look at the conventional folks once you had made the transition to the other side? Glad I'm not you. <laughs> You know, I, and I mean, maybe it, even a responsibility for them because you're no longer them. You know what it's like to be on that conventional side. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. The 82nd was a great place to grow up. Right. Don't get me wrong. As a young, as a young man coming in, um, I had good leaders, which the key thing that you see and not saying that you, you don't have some, some bad leaders within special operations, but for the most part, you've got solid dudes, right? Conventional side, that, guy that's first coming in his first leadership will dictate whether he stays in or gets out if you've got terrible leadership typically guys are going to bail ets do whatever because they're like i didn't sign up for this crap right guys guys don't mind being told what to do as long as it makes sense right don't sit there and go yeah hey guys uh hang out till 1700 and then at 1700 and you've wasted all afternoon i come and go yeah pt at zero six Come on, dude. We knew that anyway, right? Quit wasting people's time or you just do stupid stuff just to do stupid stuff. Um, and my hat's off to the conventional guys, right? Because their biggest struggle is all leadership. Um, I was doing some work, you know, a couple of years back with those guys. And it's like, hey, we can't do this, this, and this. Yes, you can. Well, they're saying we can't. Well, they're wrong, right? You, your leaders are wrong because they're spineless, they're spineless jellyfish is what you see on the conventional side and, and what you're seeing in the military as a whole. You're seeing this big woke shift. Um, U.S. military is here to fight the nation's wars. How do we fight and win the nation's wars? With good leaders, right? I want the ultimate war fighter I can. And that means you get out and train. Don't sit there and tell me, oh, we can't do that in the range. Oh, you can't do this. You can't do that. Okay. Is it illegal, immoral, or unethical? Nope, nope, nope. Boom. Execute. Yeah. And if we can't, you tell me what we need to do to fix it. And it, there's been times, again, I am a veteran. Why am I telling an active duty SAR major, you can do this, this, and this? Oh, no, we can't. Yes, you can. You're saying no because you're afraid of something, right? Execute the authority you've been given. It's your leadership responsibility to take care of these people underneath you. And make it happen. And that was the biggest thing. I mean, even over in uh, over in Iraq and Afghanistan, right? You look at the conventional forces. Hey, dude, you've got night vision. How about you use it? 
Why are you driving around with white lights at night saying, hey, bad guys, here we are? Because you got somebody that's not enforcing it, right? Or you're not training it or you're not working it. And granted, whoever the idiot was that said, hey, we go with the monocle uh, to save money, I guess, is the only reason, right? Is the only reason I can think of. Don't say I'm preserving my night vision because if I've got them on both eyes, it don't matter, dope. But um, at, at least train them, you know, at least add to your survivability. Why are you giving the enemy a chance? No, I want you to be the most ruthless, lethal, violent force out there. And it boils down to leaders. You're going to put the effort in. You're going to supervise these dudes. You're going to put a boot in their butt. And trust me, guys won't balk at it, right? If you're a firm leader and they know, hey, man, this guy's going to pull me out of a pinch. Because my leadership philosophy was this. Don't lie to me. And I've got your back, right? Right, wrong, or indifferent, I've got your back. If you jack something up and there's nothing I can do to help you, I'm still going to walk with you, right? I'm not going to abandon you. I'm not going to cut you away. But there's nothing I can do to help. If you tell me the truth, and here's the deal, and there's something we can do that I can do as a leader to intervene, I got you all day long. But don't you ever lie to me. And it, it, it's easy, right? And you stand up for your people. You fight for your people. If the ASP goes, hey, we don't have bullets, cool. What can we do to get bullets? Who hasn't used their bullets? Give me those. Do, what do we got to do to fix something? Oh, you can't use that range. Why? You know, who do I got to talk to to get it, right? <laughs> All these things. It's so true. It's it, so true. Yeah. But but that's the that's the key part is you just see a different mind shift change, you know, within the special operations side. My thing was, if you tell me no, you're not the guy I need to talk to. So I got to go find somebody else. Perfect segue. I, I wanted to touch on something you had mentioned earlier, and you cannot have teed it up better. So you you talked about making this transition and encouraging vets to become entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of folks would hear about your background and they hear about the special ops community and they would think, well, you had to operate like an entrepreneur. But you're talking about how you had to learn a lot of these things after you mm -hmm. got out. For people who think that you are operating as an entrepreneur to some degree in the special ops community, not taking no for an answer, figuring out the right mm -hmm. person to go to, how did you see the balance between those two, the private sector, like entrepreneurship versus what people might expect in the special ops community? So here's the thing. You don't have to market per se within the army, right? It's about leadership and managing people. Yes, I've got to manage some some resources, some assets, some stuff like that, right? Um, so if you want to sit there and go, hey, my bullets are my working capital, as an example. How am I stretching my working capital for the most? You know, if I've only got X amount, how do I stretch them out? How do I work this training schedule? How do I do all that? How do I make sure that my people, oh, my people, my employees, right? The people I'm responsible for, how do I put them ahead of my needs? How do I make sure that they're taken care of? But the, the key takeaway or the part that took me a while to learn was the marketing piece, right? So being a quiet professional, not out there bragging, boasting, doing all that, right? I'm just a guy that was super blessed and fortunate to be given some phenomenal opportunities. Now you've got to sit there and figure out, hey, how do you package this thing up? You know, yes, we've figured out uh, our elevator pitch, all that other stuff. But I would say this, just not from the special operations side, even just the... There are great people within just the conventional forces as well, right? They just get stuck in certain spots and, or maybe they don't see the opportunity. Um, if you've been in, you know how to be an entrepreneur to an extent. The one failing point is potentially your examples. Because if you look at the military or if you look at the, you know, the government, the government was a business or the military was a business, they'd be bankrupt because they operate poorly on that aspect. Do they truly take care of their people? Because as, a, as an entrepreneur, here's the deal. I care about Warhog Tactical. I care about those umbrella Warhog Tactical, right? You want to sit there and tell me I'm too masculine? I'm going to tell you, go, you're damn right. I need to be a little more. I got to go hit the gym. I need a little more protein, right? I got to get fired up. <laughs> you know, I'm sure not changing my name because it offends you and spending what? Uh, I think DOD has to spend $62.5 million to change some, um, some base names. Oh, the, oh, by the way, because they were quote unquote Confederate generals. Oh, but we're actually, at least for Bragg, I can speak for Bragg. I can't speak for the others. Bragg was also a U.S. general, but I guess that doesn't count, right? So know your history, you dopes. And that's what kills me is you got 
you've got a society that is so woke, so soft that God forbid violence ever comes that way, man. I don't know that they're up for the task. I really don't. And is it smoker's corner and is it all those wrestling practices and everything else that makes you a little harder? I don't know. But I will tell you this. I have concerns. If you want to sit there and send, spend $62.5 million to change base names, what could I do with that $62.5 million? What could I do for the warfighter? How about you hire Warhawk Tactical? I'll give you some training on, you know, for $62.5 million. <laughs> hey, how to change your name or change your uh, change your mindset and step up to the plate and lead these boys. How about them apples, right? That's a concept for you. But today, I don't know, you know, I'm about five years separated. I don't know the guys getting out today, what they're seeing. It's a big social experiment in the military, you know, and they're doing things that I think is uh, criminal and shouldn't be done. And it's not your place to conduct your social experiments. It's your place to build war fighters so that God forbid this country needs to be defended. You've got able-bodied people that will get out there and will crush the enemy. I, I don't know if this will be a touchy subject, but do you feel like many generations say the same thing as they exit or they look back on new generations? <clears throat> we're no, because I think we're at a tilting point here, right? And here's why. Um, my history serves me right. 1916. I think Bragg was called Bragg. And now we want to change it because he was a Confederate general. That's still U.S. history, right? Why are we trying to remove U.S. history? That's the question of the hour, right? So you can look at it generationally. Here's my thing. You know, we want to give, you know, we want to get women in combat arms, right? I would tell you this. If I was a platoon sergeant, I don't care if she's the best female going. I don't need the drama in my platoon. Right? I don't want that drama because at the end of the day, 18-year-old kids, man, what are they thinking about? Come on, man. Uh, the Army is not the place for social experiments. I'm sorry. The Army is the place that when this country needs to be defended, they strap up their boots and they go. It doesn't need to be, oh, can we make this work? Oh, oh, we can't use – like if I were to sit there and go, hey, guys, and there were ladies there, they'd be offended. Well, guys is a unisex term, Warhawk tactical. How about them apples, right? Oh, you offend me. Give me a break. I, I think we're at a different place. Now, granted, our World War II guys, absolutely hard, right? If you can walk across Europe with a set of jump boots on, 100, trust me, you are harder than me. Um, our Vietnam guys, different era, right? A lot of them got drafted in there. A lot of them didn't want to be there. A lot of them did the job, right? Different times. I'm going to tell you this, our GWAT generation, man, hard people, without a doubt. Some amazing things done on the battlefield, without a doubt. But where we currently sit at has me worried. And, and I don't think, I think all the generations, right, would look at this one here and go, what are you people doing? So that's just my take on that. Gotcha. Now you've got several efforts in five years. And I know some, as you as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Warhog Tactical started a long time ago, but it's been rebranded, sure. right? Yeah. You've got a book, you've got a podcast, you've got the company, um, the, the training side of the company. Mm -hmm. How do you divide your time now with all of these efforts? Ooh. Where do you focus? So here's the thing. It goes back to, um, so we talked earlier about journaling, right? So it's about having that notebook. I'm a firm believer in pen to paper. So it's about laying things out. Hey, what are my priorities? So really for me, this week is focused on trying to get everything straight for SHOT Show next week, right? Making sure I've got my meeting straight. Um, do we have all those coordinations going on? We've got some additional things going on that we've got to make sure all that stuff is straight. So I've got to make sure that that's kind of my number one focus, right? Um, we still got the podcast going on. So that's always going. Uh, the book's kind of on autopilot. We just got to sit there and, and just promote it. Um, we just put out a via Panio Productions uh, a great 15 minute product video on that one. Uh, we've also do instructional videos, which are combat carbine 
instructional video be coming out here shortly, which goes hand in hand with the firearm training notebook. Um, you know, same thing with the, the K9 products, you know, they're kind of on autopilot. Hey, somebody says they're in orders. We put fulfill, um, still trying to work out some coordination with some different law enforcement agencies we're working on. We've got some nonprofit stuff. We're still trying to work on. Jeez. We're also working on a canine documentary, um, trying to go back from world war two, which we do believe we have lost all our world war two handlers. Um, uh, but we've got our Korean ones, our Vietnam ones. Um, there's some big things on the canine side. Stay tuned for, for 2023. That's cool. There's going to be there. Yeah. And, and I don't want to let cats out of bags because I don't like to make false promises, but if we can pull off some things we've got planned, uh, be epically huge. So, yeah. So, it, and it, it's evident that you're a planner just from the way you were talking about some of the other, well, um, some of the other work you've done. You, you you were, you, yeah. You, you have to, you have to plan out your time. Right. And, and like I said, I, guys, the journal, so it's a twofold deal, right? So yes, I've got my notebook, but also, you know, to write down in journal, kind of recap the day. Hey, man. Hey, dummy. You took way too much time. You know, you took unexpected phone calls that burnt time from here that you need to do this. Hey, next time, just let it roll. Get back to them, you know, the next day or do this. Learn. Every day should be learning, right? You're going to have failure throughout your life. And you can judge what is failure. Hey, was I most efficient with today? No, I wasn't. Why? Was it my own personal doing? Was it something I could have changed? But if you're not putting pen to paper, and plus two, sometimes we'll go down the, the therapeutic road of, of journaling as well, but it's just my notes for me, right? Hey, get stuff scheduled. Don't deviate because you need every single second of today to maximize your time to be as productive as you can. So- and that's something you do, you kind of at end of the day, you journal what you had done and accomplished and what, what's coming next. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'll pretty much kind of journal, uh, at the evening kind of, Hey, here was, here's kind of what my day went on. And then I look at, uh, if you want to say what I needed to get accomplished today, that if I didn't, okay, Hey, I've got to do a carryover to the next day and then, okay, what do I've got to get accomplished tomorrow? And here's all the things. So, so I've yeah. kind of got that checklist. So now I can sit there and go, because here's the thing, I'm dealing with TBI, right? My brain does not function 100%. If I don't put pen to paper, something's going to fall through the cracks. Um, But I also start the day when I get up, take that big, deep breath of, of air in my lungs. I thank God that I'm alive, right? Because today's a great day because I'm on this side of the dirt. And then I sit there, whip out that notebook, and I write down three things that I'm grateful for. And I just don't go, I'm grateful for my family and I'm grateful for the dig deep, right? I want to sit there and go, no kidding. Hey, God, thanks for that, you know, that phone call, email, whatever yesterday that's doing this, this, and this. Boom. That's number one. Hey, thankful for, hey, my son's getting ready to graduate from North Carolina Harbor Patrol Academy, right? Hey, I'm thankful that you have given him success through there. Boom. I, I mean, just dig, dig deep in what you're grateful for. And then throughout my day, especially when I'm out of this house, I'm looking for an act of kindness. If I can get multiple. Yeah. Like I typically, I go to the post office quite a bit just to do fulfillment stuff, right? Nothing better than holding the door for somebody. I don't care if you're male, female. I do like holding the door open for the ladies with the strollers, right? Cause I know what it's like trying to work that stroller through a double door. Boom. There you go. And they're shocked. And you watch these dudes just walk past them. Hey man, she's got a box. She's got little kids. Just look for an act of kindness. It should make your heart feel good. But we're so enveloped today and just looking at this box and just getting garbage shoved in our head. No way, man. Open up your aperture. So like that. Yeah. Um, and then last thing I had here along what's going on now is you were look as you're planning, I assume you did a, a pretty rigid planning for 2023. Mm -hmm. without letting cats out of the bag. Is there, is there anything you were thinking, I want to invest more time on this for this coming year, since we're at the outset of it. So I had to put more time. My, so here's what happened. We do a lot of focus on law enforcement training. I had to put more open enrollment classes out there because guys were, Hey man, there's no open enrollment. Okay. My LEOs are getting burnt down way too much. I just want to give them a fighting chance, right? God forbid they're in that deadly force encounter. I want them to have the skills. I hope they never have to use, but if they do, 
get rid of that threat as quick as you can. I want you to come home to your families first and foremost. Uh, I think we're at 206, if I recollect correctly. Oh, no, that was last year. I think we finished it. I don't know. I'd, I'd have to, it was over 200 we lost last year, right? Get the number to zero, right? I, I don't want to see any of these guys be lost. So that's the focus. It's still going to be the focus. And we still got what guys won't see is all the law enforcement training we're doing because it's not publicized unless we're doing a specific um, law enforcement only class. So I had some guys reach out to me up in, in New York, New Jersey area. Hey, we're struggling clearing rooms as patrol officers. Okay, we will do a specific. And we're not dubbing it CQB. It's not close quarters combat, right? It's just room clearing for the patrol officer. So you and your, you know, partner show up. Hey, man, here's how you guys just work this problem. So, um, no, we'll still do. We'll still focus on our law enforcement stuff. That will always be the the, um, you know, first and foremost that we try to focus on. Um, military guys, obviously, when they reach out as well because they're going on harm's way, keep them safe. Yes, I need to keep my regular civilians as well. Um. But yeah, that's the, plus we've got some other pokers in there that we're just not going to disclose. Yep. Um, because like I said, for me, I don't want to disclose. And then people go, well, you said you were going to do this. Yeah. And then you can't pull it off. But I, but I think we're going to just stay tuned. That's all I'll say. Got it. So and yeah. you, you mentioned a couple of times that people, do people really comment like, oh, you're crying on the air. Why are you doing that? Or you're weak. Does that really happen for you? Uh, not so much for me. I mean, for the most part, people are, are um, and I don't pay a, pay a whole bunch of attention to what yeah, people say, but, but for the that. most part, um, my mates will tell me, hey, man, hats off to you. Yeah. You know, that, that takes guts to be vulnerable, right? But we we grew up in an era where yeah. men, men don't cry, right? And people think that, yeah, you know, I am vulnerable. Whoopie ding. Hey, look at me. I got emotions. I'm a human being. Roger that. I'm also Rick Hogg. I got no dramas transitioning out of the military. How about them apples, right? Warhog tactical. That's my business. We can, I mean, we can go on and on. So you can sit there and argue all you want. Um, you know, but you've heard some, you know, there's been some rumblings that I've heard from, you know, third parties. Oh, so-and-so said that. I don't care what so-and-so says. I really don't care. You know, are you jealous? Maybe you got some dramas you need to deal with. I, yeah. I don't know. So. Man. All right. Last two questions that I ask everybody, Rick, and then I'll, I'll let you get out of here. Yeah, buddy. First one is, is there anything that you carried with you into combat that had sentimental value, maybe something that someone gave you that you just wanted to have on you or nearby? Yep. yep. Um, so my wife gave me um, a gold cross she used to wear. Um, it was thin enough and it was basically 100 mile an hour taped underneath my watch and it was always there. Yep. So I had... Uh, you know, obviously God riding there. And then I had her via that. So, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Yep. Um, the last question I try to ask everybody is, mm -hmm. uh, looking back 29 years is a long time to be there missing half of your, your daughter's yep. birthdays. As you mentioned, the sacrifices losing Joe Duco along the way, would you go back and do it all again? Yeah, I would. Yeah. And I would like to sit there and say I would change things. I don't think I would. You know, I might do the phone calls. I would have done the phone calls earlier. But no. Back it, home? It, it, yeah. 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 Just to do that. Because I didn't realize that. Uh, just putting her mind at ease. But it's it's one of those that. When you run with some incredible people. You don't want to let them down. You know. And I got it. We caused pain and drama to the family. We did. And I'd love to sit there and, and go, yeah, I'd like to change it. Truth be told. Mm -mm. No way. God put me there for a reason. God does things to you. Uh, I don't know why. I can't explain all of it. But it's all his plan at the end of the day. And, yeah, so I guess if he... uh Either I bucked it, didn't hear the the words of wisdom from him, but no, I would, I would do it. Yeah, same, same. It's interesting. Uh, interviewed Derek Natalini, another uh, Yusasak guy, who mm -hmm. said something very similar. Like, do it again, but those days where I stayed late to go hit the range one more time, I would have come home and had yeah. dinner at the house. Yeah, would have tweaked, would have tweaked some things to better enhance the family life, without a doubt. Yeah. 
Yeah. And maybe that time that mama needed me to come home, you know, all right. Yeah. Let's, let's figure this thing out. But yeah. And I did lie. There's one other question I did want yeah, to but... ask Rick and then I'll let you go, but yeah. it's, it's a question that I actually got from a listener and I've, I've heard okay. this from a few folks and I want to be more concerned about asking this, mm -hmm. especially somebody like yourself who's been at these elite levels. Was there a book or something along the way that you had read that really resonated with you that you end up recommending to people frequently? Go read the Bible. Yeah. Uh, um, it, I'm a big, I'm a big fan um, of U.S. and military history, right? So depending where you're, um, depending what you like, I'm a big Cold War guy, right? The Soviets are still around. They just changed their name. Don't let them fool you. Um, so like if you read, um, Oh, I'm drawing a blank right now because that's part of the problem when you got TBI is you can't recollect, um, can't recollect stuff. Uh, it's the book about the special forces, um, you know, over in Berlin. Um, that's a great read. Um, I'll find it and I'll put it in it, our uh, show notes. It was, it was sitting. I thought I had it somewhere around, but I might have moved it anyway. Um, it's no, that was a good day, maybe. No. Yes. No, I think that that might have been special it. forces <laughs> Berlin. Yep. Might've been it. Special forces, uh, detachment, a, um, SOGS, SOGS, another great one. Um, because again, you look at it, Vietnam still falls in the cold war era, right? And some of the things, when you look at what those guys did with SOG, absolutely incredible. And you're like, okay. man, if I, yeah, if I could get those guys here today, um, man, it's like, how did you guys do some of the things you did? Absolutely. Just incredible right um there's also uh so john plaza wrote that one i know um john meyer john Shrek meyer wrote some a uh, couple yep. ones as well there's the big thick like if you can get the the colored ones they run like 175 bucks a whack um those are just an incredible one sog related ones yeah yeah i think there's six or seven volumes um super impressed with those guys right because if you look at it those guys were, they kind of set the standard, you know, for special operations where it is today, in my opinion. Um, I know the SEALs even dabbled with the dog program over there in Vietnam. Wasn't too successful, but, you know, I mean, you look at like our uniforms today. Ooh, we got pockets on the sleeves. People think they're all cool. Go look a picture at, um, um, I think it was Frank Miller had one. Here he is out there in the bush. And what do you see? He took his OG-107 pocket and put it up there, right? Guys, nothing new, man. Those guys, are the, they're the ones that kind of did all that stuff. Um, just absolutely amazing. So, yeah, those guys, if you ever get a chance to talk to them, talk to them. They are a super wealth of knowledge. Um, those dudes absolutely uh, wore some Superman capes for some of the things they did. So, yeah. They did. They did. Yeah. Man, Rick, thanks so much for the time. Um, yeah, buddy. All the work you're doing, just not just with uh, Warhawk Tactical, but the Duco program, that's pretty cool. You're keeping that alive mm -hmm. and, and the opportunity for people to, to support that. So we'll have links to all this. Yeah. Thank you so much for the time, man. Thanks for having me on, brother. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed that combat story. These tier one operators always amaze me with uh, what they've been through and their perspective. So I hope you enjoyed it as well. Uh, just a couple listener comments. First one is on YouTube about the Billy Billingham interview from uh, DWR about K. Probably mispronounced that. He says, this is one of the greatest interviews of Billy Billingham I've seen. Good questions, and the host lets Mr. Billingham talk. He's such an amazing storyteller. I thought, wow, an hour 45, that is long. And here I am thinking, what? Already over. But I want to hear more. Awesome content. I really like the Nike Squadron and Hotel California stories as well. Very intense. I appreciate that. Um, Billy was just a great uh, guest to have on, both for his background, but he is such a great storyteller. And man, he has been around some really impressive people. So he he is not afraid to uh, to share what he sees and what it, what he's been doing. So I, I really enjoyed talking to him. Next comment from the same listener on YouTube, but on the Zach Harrison interview. And he said, Ryan, I just wanted to say thank you for these interviews. You ask all the questions I have on my mind when you have a guest like this. 
You ask, you let them reply. I could listen to these stories all day long. You hear so much of it in the general media, but nothing this deep and personal. I uh, really appreciate it yet again. And um, actually, Zach just reached out to me when we had 100,000 uh, subscribers on YouTube just to say congrats. And he's such, he's such like a soft-spoken, down-to-earth guy. So I'm really pleased the way that interview turned out. I mean, that guy is a door kicker for sure. Tip of the spear type of guy who's just trying to help other people wherever he can. So glad it came through. Appreciate the support, y'all. Stay safe.